Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers. It really, truly is an honor to be here, to be speaking with my colleagues and collaborators. Um, I was asked to speak about patient-reported outcomes and academic perspective on clinical research. So what I'd like to do with you this morning is talk a little bit about PROs. We actually haven't spent much time talking about PROs specifically yet, and talk about where I think we are in terms of pediatric oncology clinical research. Uh, and I'd like to describe my recommendations for where I think we ought to go as a community in pediatrics, and then end with some conclusions. So patient-reported outcomes allow us to communicate the patient experience. They include symptoms such as fatigue, nausea, and pain, physical functions such as the ability to white, uh, walk, write, and eat and drink. Psychosocial health is very important, so symptoms such as sadness and worry and anger. And then there are other PROs such as satisfaction and treatment adherence. So this is the um, FDA's, uh, FDA's position on PROs taken verbatim, as you can see. So a PRO is a measurement based on a report that comes directly from the patient about the status of the patient's health condition without amendment or interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician. More specifically, proxy reported outcomes are not PROs, and we discourage use of proxy reported outcome measures, particularly for symptoms that can only be known by the patient. I think it's important at this point to note that health-related quality of life is not the same thing as PROs. They're overlapping concepts. Health-related quality of life is a multi-dimensional concept that represents the patient's general perception of the effects of illness and treatment on physical, psychosocial, and social aspects of health. So I spend a lot of time trying to defend why we should collect PROs in research studies, and I do think it's important. I think it's really important that we describe PRO. So why is that? It's like Eric said in his talk, clinicians are not always good at picking up PROs. And if we don't measure it, we won't know about the extent of the problem. And I think it's really important to families to tell them this is what to expect. These are the symptoms we believe your child will likely experience. This also tells us as researchers when should we intervene? What are the children that we ought to look for um, uh, intervening with prophylactic strategies? I think it's also important to collect PROs to create risk prediction um, schemas. So as Smith has so eloquently pointed out, we're coming to the point where we can hopefully better and better predict different outcomes. If we can predict PROs with more certainty, Again, that provides a st uh, identification of when we should intervene with prophylactic strategies, and we may identify risk factors which are modifiable. And third, I think we need to collect PROs for decision making and decision analysis to help us understand the best treatment choice and to conduct cost effectiveness analysis so that we can quantify costs and benefits. I think that use of PROs for decision making is actually the most important reason to do research uh, with PROs, although it's the most controversial. So PROs are not all the same. Some PROs are transient, self-limiting. Others are debilitating and permanent. When you think about decision making, think about three general things that will influence our decisions, survival, quality of life, and costs. When survival differences are large, PROs are less likely to influence our decision, but they could. If that PRO is disab disabling and permanent. But the most more common situation is when our survival differences are small or uncertain. And I think it's really in this situation that PROs can impact on the decisions that families would want to be able to make about the treatment their child receives. But the context is important. The context and how the, the context will um, impact greatly on how the family will value quality of life 
and survival outcomes. So if a child has a 0% chance of cure, surely that parent will value short-term toxicities more than long-term toxicities. Conversely, a family with a 100% chance of cure will almost certainly value long-term toxicities more than short-term toxicities. The problem is, is that we're rarely working at these two ends of the spectrum. And more commonly, our estimates are uncertain of chance of cure with wide confidence intervals, and further, it's a moving target. So as new therapies are developed, our chance of cure in five years may be different than our chance of cure five years ago. So I think it is a world of uncertainty for families if they're trying to make these decisions. So why should we focus on patient reported outcomes and not rely upon clinicians? So there have been several studies published that support the same notions that doctors just aren't very good at it. So this particular study comes from the Italian NCI, and it was published in JCO just this year. And this study evaluates 1,000 uh, breast cancer and lung cancer patients and had physicians record toxicities according to the CTCAE and had patients directly report symptoms. And they focused on six symptoms, and I'm showing five here. The green bars are the number of patients in which only the physician reported the toxicity and not the patient. But much more concerning, these very big pink bars represent the number of patients who reported the symptom not detected by their clinician. Again, just reinforcing that as clinicians, we're not good at reporting or identifying these symptoms. This particular study defined underreporting as when the physician graded no toxicity across the cycles and the patient reported some toxicity. And as you can see, the rate of underreporting for any toxicity ranges from 40 to 80, 75 percent of patients. So that's a huge amount of underreporting. And even for severe symptoms, when the patient said my symptoms were very severe, the rate of underreporting was from 10 to 50 percent. So this really brings back the reason for why we need to measure PROs. So the current state of our PROs and COG, um, I don't actually have a good answer for you in terms of all of PROs. We did have a, a look at how we're doing in terms of quality of life studies, so similar to PROs, and we recognize that we had been doing decades of research and quality of life within the cooperative group, but yet we didn't have a really good handle on what was happening. What happened to those studies? Did we use those results? So um, we took this initiative, um, under this initiative where our objective was to describe the proportion of closed COG studies with a quality of life aim that was successful. And we defined success in terms of accrual, analysis, and knowledge dissemination. So we identified 16 studies um, with a quality of life aim, nine of which were therapeutic studies with a secondary quality of life aim. In about the same window of time, there were 86 therapeutic trials closed. So with my quick back of the uh, envelope calculation, if you look at this same time period, about 10% of phase two and phase three COG therapeutic studies had a quality of life aim. And these numbers are hard to get, uh, but from the NCI, the Canadian NCI Clinical Trials Group, from 1990 to 2007, 92% of their studies included a quality of life aim. So the current state of PROs within COG, I just showed you, we have very few therapeutic studies with PROs. Um, currently, the Division of Cancer Prevention is not supporting descriptive studies in general. Uh, we lack a core set of instruments of, or symptoms. Um, there are a lack of instruments available for adolescents and young adults. Uh, we have logistical challenges with data management. We have a lack of coordination with other groups and little to no emphasis on knowledge dissemination. So I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail in some subsequent slides. So before I do that, it might be helpful for us to look to our adult counterparts to see 
where are they in terms of recommendations for PROs? And this uh, set of recommendations came from Ethan Bash, was published in 2012, where uh, he convened a panel, and these are their recommendations for adult oncology trials. So they recommend to include a PRO measure in all prospective clinical comparative effectiveness research studies in adult oncology, include uh, patient reported symptoms that are appropriate to the setting, to include an assessment of quality of life, to collect PRO information via electronic data capture technologies whenever possible, and to report the proportion of patients experiencing a meaningful change from baseline. So I just want to highlight that last point as being something I'm going to come back to later. So I'd like to provide my recommendations for PROs. I have a very big disclaimer. These are my personal recommendations. These are not the, uh, the views of COG. I, I, I don't even want to look at Peter Adamson in the back and <laughs> think about what he's thinking right now. So he, he, they're all mine. So, and I'm speaking to you from my perspective as chair of the COG Cancer Control Committee that has been overseeing a lot of these types of studies, and my main job is a clinician scientist working in this area. So recommendation number one, I would, I think we ought to as a community identify trial and PRO characteristics in which PROs should be incorporated into phase two and three clinical trials. We spend an enormous amount of time um, in the regulatory process to incorporate PROs into clinical trials. We spend a lot of time. Um, they're frequently rejected. What I would like to say is that much, in much of the same way the therapeutic world has learned to be efficient about making go, no-go decisions early, I think for PROs we have to do the same thing. We have to be able to make go, no-go decisions early on primary PRO questions, and this will require collaboration from COG and the NCI. So I'm looking in that direction. <laughs> uh, and, and at least agree on the primary aim and that the questions are important. And then we can worry about the details. One of the areas that I think we've neglected to study is the poor prognosis setting. And I think it's really critical that we measure PROs in the phase one setting, in, in um, patients who are unlikely to be cured, because that is the setting where PROs really matter and can impact on parents' decision making. And I think that not only do the COG and NCI have to have a role in this, parents and parent support groups will be critically important in understanding which trials ought to have PRO endpoints. So recommendation number two, this will be a controversial one, I can feel it already. So <laughs> to clarify the role of parent, guardian versus self-report PROs in pediatric oncology, I will remind you from the quote from the FDA, so proxy report is not a PRO, we discourage use of proxy reported outcomes, particularly for symptoms that can only be known by the patient. For patients who cannot respond for themselves, we encourage observer reports that include only those events or behaviors that can be observed. So when we talk about proxy report, um, you know, we're talking about uh, self-report from the child. I think we're typically talking about parent guardian versus healthcare provider. I'm gonna cross that off because we've just talked about how we as clinicians aren't that very good, aren't that good at recognizing patient symptoms. So I'm really gonna focus on the parent as a proxy respondent. So what is the concordance between parents and children? So the PEDS-QL is a quality of life instrument that's the most common instrument used in pediatric cancer. There have been a couple systematic reviews that have tried to adjust this uh, question. For most of the domains, there is a moderate to good agreement, but they are different. Uh, differences are really common. Sometimes it's not by a very meaningful amount, but some studies do show large differences, and there's conflicting data on whether parents overestimate or underestimate health. So what, do we gonna, what will we do then if they're not the same? Is self-report always feasible? No. It will never always be feasible. 
So there's the issue of age. So young children will just, at some point, we will not be able to collect their self-report. I'm actually quite worried about this one, illness acuity. So in my clinical experience, in my COG experience, it's very clear to me that very ill children will not agree to report their symptoms and that parents will not burden their children with requests. So what do we do? Do we say, we just have to do it? We're just going to always do self-report. I think that's a real problem. I think that we will end up excluding a very important segment. We'll exclude younger children. We'll exclude our sickest children. So the children we want to know the most about will exclude if we go this report. Should we record only observed events or behavior? So this works in the NICU with babies and uh, telemetry. I'm not sure this works in pediatric oncology. Children with cancer cry for lots of reasons other than pain, and I'm not sure that's a good surrogate for pain. P uh, children with cancer don't eat very much for lots of reasons. Even normal children don't eat lots for not lots of reasons other than anorexia. So I, I don't know that this is a practical approach for us. We could create new instruments for young, sick children that were very one, one item questions, very simple, three point Likert scales. So we can try to do that and indeed we have created a symptom screening tool within my own research program which does something similar to that. However, when we do that, we lose sensitivity, right? So we may not be able to measure differences that are important to the child if we simplify our scales that much. And we also don't know whether or not we're going to get around the main problem. Can we access those children? The last option is to accept parents or guardians as valid reporters of their child's symptoms. So what I would like to do, think we ought to do, is to identify the role for parents and guardians uh, for, as proxy respondents, and then whatever that setting is, to use them consistently. But I think it's important that we identify feasible ways for children to self-report, to supplement their parent report. I told you that would be controversial, so I'm waiting for the questions for that. So my recommendations number three. I think that there are lots of choices for PROs. So PROs is a big area, right? So um, mouse sores and pain and fatigue and quality of life. I think we ought to strive for a core PRO instrument set. There's lots of reasons to do that. I think it allows us to develop expertise in particular instruments. Importantly, you know, we talked about, about mining of data. It will allow us to compare across studies. It'll provide us a rich foundation for meta-analysis. Allows us to compare different disease groups and allows us to look at trends over time. And this core data set would require input of patients and parents in addition to COG and NCI and funders. So recommendation number four. I think we need to identify PROs which can be used in AYA oncology. So it'll be well known to many of you in the audience that there is a disparity related to adults and, young can uh, adults and adolescents and young adults. AYAs have not enjoyed the same incremental improvement in survival compared to their younger and older uh, um, patients. What we don't know is do AYA patients suffer disproportionately? And one reason we don't know is that we don't have adequate instrumentation to be able to answer this question. All PRO instruments require validation and they're all validated within specific age ranges. So almost all pediatric instruments go up to age 18. Almost all adult instruments start at age 18 and go up. So we have a real problem if we're trying to do analyses from 15 to 40. So I really believe we need to do some fundamental work to be able to have validated instruments that cross this age range. Recommendation number five. I think we need to do some foundational work 
to, uh, to look at minimal clinically important differences. So the MCID is the foundation for how we calculate sample size for phase three trials. It is the smallest difference considered important to patients. I would say that I feel in general we've done very little work on uh, knowing what MCIDs are in all of pediatric cancer, not just in PROs. But if we are to design randomized trials with PRO endpoints, we need to understand what changes in fatigue and pain in quality of life, what are the smallest changes that matter to patients, that matter to families. Recommendation number six, our um, PRO logistics are decades behind, so we are still in general using pen and paper administrations, data entering, uh, uh, secondarily entering the data into a data system. I think we need to start to think about implementation of PROs. I think we need to develop technologies that can be used across most platforms. So it won't help us, we won't be any further ahead if we develop electronic PROs only for iPhones, right? Because then we'll exclude huge amounts of the population. Um, we need to develop PR, uh, PROs that can integrate with clinical trial data. That's really important. Um, and ideally that can integrate with adult group data so that we can understand the patient experience and how do children compare to adults. Hey, I see I'm red. Okay, I've got two more slides. <laughs> so recommendation number seven. I think we need to focus on data quality, completion of trials, and dissemination of knowledge. So that previous study that I showed you, we identified 16 trials with a quality of, of life aim. But I didn't show you the outcomes, so here are the outcomes. Nine of those studies um, were successful in accrual, and that's using a very generous measure of accrual. Uh, seven ha had uh, statistical analysis completed. 56% were presented at a conference, and only 38% were published in the peer-reviewed literature. These are a group of studies that were all closed, of which half of them were closed prior to 2005, so a very long time ago. So I believe that when we do research and we don't disseminate that knowledge, we do a disservice to families and patients. Families and patients have generously donated their time and effort, and for the most part, those reasons are altruistic. They want to help think that if we don't disseminate the information that we um, obtain from their input, then, then I think that's uh, not good. So I think that we should mandate that PRO endpoints be analyzed and published and share solutions and challenges with other clinical researchers. And my last uh, recommendation is to bring PROs to the patient bedside. There are lots of reasons to do that, to improve communication between patients and providers. At least in adults, it can alert providers to key symptoms and improves patient satisfaction. It saves time during clinic encounters and it may improve symptom control. But how to best do that, I think is still uncertain. So I think that needs to be a focus and relates to this idea of implementation. So in conclusion, um, I do think PROs are important to include in clinical research, both within and outside of the children's oncology group. I think there's an overall need to simplify and standardize the process for PRO incorporation and funding in pediatric cancer clinical trials. I think we need to think about methodologic issues, because if we don't, we'll be behind. And we need to emphasize knowledge dissemination, not just of individual studies, but as a collective body as a whole. And finally, we need to bring PROs to the bedside. Thank you very much.